In our modern fitness culture, it's often not enough to just be maximally jacked with minimal function. Our standards have evolved over time to be a bit less realistic with the ever greater number of fake natties popping up in the scene. Nowadays, it's actually a lot more common to expect someone to have the physique of a Greek god and the strength to match it. And continuing with this trend, sooner or later, you'll find that it will be expected for us to not only have good physiques and the ability to move heavy circles on the three compounds, but to have outlandish and quite frankly, impossible capabilities such as having the ability to perform athletic endeavors, or worse, having good cardiovascular health, which we of course all know to be myths created by corporate cabals such as Big Treadmill and Big Stairmaster. However, if things like athletic performance were true, and you for some reason wanted to increase your performance or obtain higher numbers on specific lifts, you'd probably want to use something known as the principle of specificity to help you achieve such goals. However, when the average lifter thinks of specificity, they often greatly oversimplify its use in practice and just assume that more specificity is always better. The science behind specificity, however, is of course a bit more nuanced. So without causing any further delay, let's dig into what the scientific literature has to say. Starting with some brief definitions and explanations, the principle of specificity of training states that the way the body responds to physical activity is very specific to the activity itself. Therefore, if you want to increase your deadlift to 1RM strength, you should perform heavy deadlift singles. And if your goal was to increase vertical jump performance through weight training, you should perform explosive partial ROM squats, which is a pretty logical conclusion. So if that's the case, our next question would be, how do we decide what's more or less specific. And the most common method I see in the fitness space is to put movement and load specificity on a spectrum. And while it's true that 100% of your 1RM on the bench with the exact same form and cues as your competition bench press is as specific as specificity gets, the spectrum still doesn't make a lot of sense. For example, how do we know if doing a competition bench press at 50% of your 1RM till failure is more or less specific than doing a machine chest press at 100% of your chest chest press 1RM. In other words, is load specificity more important in this case, or is movement specificity more important? Well, to better understand which takes priority and how we can fix the spectrum to better align with our goals, we must first understand the science of how specificity's benefits work as well as its limitations. So in order to see whether or not specificity is more load dependent or movement dependent, we can look at a 2016 study by Schoenfeld et al, which split 19 resistance trained men into either a heavy group that trained in the loading range of two to four reps for eight weeks or a moderate group that trained in the loading range of eight to 12 reps for eight weeks with all other RT variables controlled. The study measured 1RM performance on the squat and bench press, as well as upper body muscle endurance and muscle thickness at three sites. However, we'll only be looking at 1RM performance. After eight weeks, they found a greater increase in both the squat and bench strength favoring the heavy group, which indicates that significant increases in strength are found with load specificity and therefore load does matter. However, we're still yet to conclude if it matters more than movement specificity. So looking at movement specificity, we can look at a 2018 study by Rossi et al, where they compared three training groups. One group training squats only for 10 weeks, another group training leg press only for 10 weeks, and a third group training squats and leg press. All other training variables were held constant, and the results of the study found that the squat only group achieved the greatest increase in squat 1RM strength, with the squat and leg press group achieving the second greatest, and of course, the leg press only group achieving the worst 1RM strength increase. However, all three groups found very similar 1RM strength gains on the leg press. So these findings illustrate that complex movements, such as multi-joint freeway movements, seem to benefit more from movement specificity. And looking at these two studies, we can see that both movement and load specificity benefit performance. However, since the squat and leg press group had significantly lower benefit on the squat performance with matched loads, we can assume that to a certain degree, movement specificity outweighs load specificity. And there doesn't seem to be any real need to apply load specificity to less complex single joint movements. It would seem that the only time to really consider load specificity is when performing the movement you want to increase performance on or when performing a very close variation of that movement. This, however, leaves us with another dilemma. If non-complex single joint movements don't seem to benefit you via specificity much, if at all, what's the point of 
I've ever including it. Following this logic, doing as much movement and load specificity as you can handle and not wasting any time on less specific loads or movements should theoretically yield the best results. And this is actually a pretty common school of thought in the fitness industry. However, when you look at the literature, this actually seems to very strongly not be the case. So clearly we're missing something here which is actually pretty obvious. Designing programs is significantly more complex than just doing bench singles five times per week. And contrary to the gearhead guru in your gym, there are significantly more factors to take into account than just specificity. And since we know hypertrophy or the accrual of more contractile tissue will also benefit performance, that alone posits the use of less complex movements with lighter loads for a greater stimulus to fatigue ratio, hopefully leading to eventual superior increases in performance. So if that's the case, how much specificity should we do? Well, lucky for us, we already have data looking at weekly set volumes effect on specificity. And the weekly volume dose for specificity is actually a lot less than some of you might think. For example, a 2017 meta-analysis by Ralph Sonatow looked at the effects of weekly set volume on strength. They took nine studies that met a strict inclusion criteria and split the studies into two categories, a one to four set per exercise per week category and a five to 12 set per week category. And they found that performing one to four sets per week yielded 80 1% of strength gains when compared to the 5 to 12 sets per week. This indicates that specificity is stronger than we think, and thankfully the most important factor is merely exposure to specific training and peak loads rather than the total volume of specific training. Now, I'd like to quickly mention when presenting this meta, it's understandable to have some pushback. For example, you might point out the fact that five of the nine studies included in this meta were on untrained individuals, and thus the findings will not likely apply to more advanced trainees. However, I hypothesize that more advanced trainees actually require less specific volume than newer trainees, given that they should already have majority of the motor skill used during a max attempt, as well as the fact that they can lift significantly greater loads than untrained individuals, therefore causing them to accumulate more fatigue with heavy compounds regardless of whether or not they match percentage 1RM with the untrained individuals. Not only that, in order to make more gains at that level, since having more contractile tissue might actually benefit them more than the principle of specificity at that point in their career, they'd likely need to prioritize exercises with a higher stimulus to fatigue ratio, and they'd likely want to waste as little time as possible on more fatiguing, less stimulating compound lifts. And not only that, we already have data showing us that advanced trainees can use low volumes on specific training and still see great results. For example, a 2021 study by Andrew lakis korakakis with the aim of exploring the minimum effective dose required to increase 1RM strength of competitive powerlifters on the squat bench and deadlift found that doing a 2-3-1 approach respectively, referring to the weekly frequency that powerlifters worked up to a single at a 9 to 9.5 RPE, then followed that single with two back offsets of three reps at 80% of that day's single, found that these powerlifters made gains greater than what would be considered meaningful by elite powerlifters and powerlifting coaches. Therefore, this further indicates that specific training is very effective even with low volumes. So the question now is, with all that data in mind, how do I apply this to my training in order to increase my 1RM strength or my athletic performance? And well, lucky for you, it's actually pretty simple. Imagining you're a powerlifter wanting to increase your squat, bench, and deadlift, I would recommend you include at least three weekly sets of the big three lifts up to around a maximum of nine weekly sets depending on the lift. Since each lift has differing fatigue costs for each individual lifter, you can of course choose a weekly set and weekly frequency that you find best matches your individual recovery capabilities. For example, I usually recommend using a frequency similar to the previously mentioned 231 approach, since for myself and most of my clients, squatting two times a week, benching three times a week, and deadlifting once a week, with each session having three working sets for a total of six, nine, and three working sets respectively, seems to be the most comfortable set and frequency approach to recover from. You, however, may of course modify the weekly frequency and set volume depending on if you can handle less or more volume. However, keep in mind that exceeding six to nine weekly sets on any given compound may not provide any additional performance benefit and may likely impede your recovery as well as be more time consuming than a lower volume approach. So once you've decided on your volume and frequency, I recommend including daily undulating periodization, AKA changing your focus with each different day you perform the lift in order order to vary your motor skill learning, which may benefit you through the principle of varied practice. For example,
example, since I bench three times a week, my first bench session would be a heavy day, which would include a heavy single top set with all my powerlifting cues in mind, and two to three back offsets in the three to five rep range with the exact same cues. My second bench day would then be a moderate rep pause focus day where I practice on my explosive power after a long pause. After that, my third bench day would be a higher rep, more partial focus day where I focus on my explosive power in the bottom half of my bench's range of motion, which is typically where I always fail on my bench PRs. Then, once you have all your highly specific training out of the way, I'd focus on including more hypertrophy focus movements in the moderate to high rep range. And you'd of course want most of these accessory lifts to be complementary to your strength and performance goals. So you'll want to use lifts that have a high stimulus to fatigue ratio, focus on the muscles you use for your goals, and possibly even choose some lifts that have similar movement patterns to your goals. For example, a dumbbell bench press in the moderate to high rep range. And once you have a program with all these heuristics in mind, I'm confident you'll see great progress with your individual strength and performance goals. Yo, what's going on guys? I'd like to thank you all so much for making it this far into the video. And I'd like to quickly mention that if you like the video and wanna see more content like this, don't forget to like and subscribe. It would be very, very much appreciated as it took a long time to get all of this information and condense it down into a easily digestible and entertaining form. So it again would be very, very much appreciated. I'd like to also mention that if you have any questions or feedback, don't forget to comment down below as I thoroughly enjoy reading all of your comments and I try to get back to every single one of you. And with that, I'll be seeing you guys in my next video. Peace.